So let's get started here tonight. What I want to talk about is five places to visit, five cool places that you can visit. And one thing I've learned in doing these audio guides and in teaching my history classes and things like that is that it's nice when you have kind of a common theme or a story for your presentation. So uh, for this, I have chosen as my theme, Mr. Theodore Roosevelt. And that's because last year we went on a big road trip and it just seemed like we kept running into TR everywhere we went. And so I called it our Teddy Roosevelt trip. He's somebody that I have uh, studied a fair amount of over the last few years anyway, and always just enjoy talking about Teddy Roosevelt. I find him a really fascinating character. So our very first stop here is going to be appropriately Theodore Roosevelt National Park. And I put this on the list partly because I figure that a lot of you have not been there, maybe haven't even heard of it. This is located in North Dakota in the middle of nowhere. And uh, um, it's it's a park that's set aside really to kind of honor Theodore Roosevelt and his time in North Dakota. So when Teddy Roosevelt was a young man, he was kind of a sickly child, had asthma and some other ailments, and his father uh, had quite a bit of money. He grew up in New York, and his father bought him basically an indoor gym to work out and uh, told him to exercise. Get, that would help him out. So he it did and he got outdoors and he just loved physical activity and he always was a believer in what he called the strenuous life that you could push yourself to the limits and it would be good for you and so here's kind of a buffed up young man you can see here kind of a muscly guy well um when he was in in his younger 20s he went out to north dakota well it's actually the dakota territory at the time to hunt uh, for, for a bison. The bison were almost extinct at this time. Now, bison once ranged or once roamed the Great Plains, over 20 million bison among the Great Plains in America. But the late 1800s saw what was called the Great Slaughter, where buffalo hunters went out and shot up all the buffalo, put them on trains, shipped them to Chicago, and did all, you know, made meat and all sorts of other things out of the buffalo. And Teddy wanted to get one before it was too late, and he did. He came out here, he hired a guy, and got a buffalo. We've got some noise going on. If uh, everybody wants to mute their, their uh, screens, please. Um, anyway, so he went home. He, he got married, and shortly after his wife gave birth, she, his mother and his wife died on the same day in the same house. And uh, this was just devastating to Teddy, who, in his journal, put a big X that day and said, the light has gone out of my life. And he was really, really distraught. They, they all lived together, and they died within hours of each other. So he escaped back out to the Dakota Badlands. He had already purchased this little cabin here, had bought into a ranch there in the Dakotas. And so this cabin, if you go there today to the park, it is, it is there at the visitor center. Originally, it was about seven miles away from, the, from where the park is, from where the visitor center is. But, uh, but he came out to get away from it all, and uh, this was the cabin that he stayed in. Now, I love this picture because you can see here that what he's trying to do is fit in with these Western frontier guys. So he was from New York, and when he went out West, they all kind of assumed he was a city slicker. The term they used back then was dandy. And they called him old four eyes. He had glasses. And uh, he was really kind of an outsider and he was trying to fit in. I just love the, the get up here that he, he's posed in. Well, turned out he was the real deal. He was very tough. And uh, somebody challenged him in a bar fight once and he knocked him out and he earned the respect of these cowboys out in the Dakotas. Uh, my favorite story is some guys stole his boat while he was away. And when he got back a few days later, he noticed his boat wasn't there. So he tracked these guys down. He got a couple of buddies. They went out along the Little Missouri River and tracked these guys down a few days later. He forced them to pose for this embarrassing photo with him holding them at gunpoint. And, uh, and it wasn't just enough to get his boat back, but uh, that his friends had to go home. 
he wanted justice. He was the guy who felt that, that you couldn't just have lawlessness out in the West. You had to have order, law and order. So he marched these guys three days back to Dickinson, North Dakota, and turned them into the sheriff there. He didn't sleep the whole time because he was afraid they were going to run away and uh, was real kind of proud of this accomplishment. Well, he gave a speech in Dickinson, North Dakota, that was kind of the launching point for his political career, this first kind of big public speech that he gave. Now, if you visit the park today, one of the cool things about it is it's just out there and there's hardly anybody around. This is a picture here, just my family in the, in the photo here. It's really quite a, a peaceful area. And certainly that's what, what Teddy experienced was kind of a peaceful rejuvenation and that's, it's kind of hard to explain it, but that's what the park is like. Um, if you go there today, you can see a herd of bison. There's also prairie dogs right here in this little area, a bunch of prairie dogs barking. It's kind of fun to see. And then there's wild horses as well. Now this is the kind of the highlight of Teddy, of Theodore Roosevelt National Park. I'm gonna go back a little bit here. If you look at the, the scenery of the place, it's not as dramatic as a lot of national parks that, that you think of. They call these the Badlands, and uh, these are the North Dakota Badlands, but the ones in South Dakota are much more dramatic and impressive and cool. So, you know, you might wonder, well, why are they setting this aside as a national park? And the horses kind of give us an indication of, of what's going on here a little bit. Typically, the National Park Service does not like having horses or donkeys or non-native animals in the park because they're not native and the national park service is typically trying to preserve their park to be as as uh, kind of pristine as, as it was before people arrived but here in Te theodore roosevelt national park they're not just preserving scenery they're preserving the time period that theodore roosevelt was there so they're preserving history as well and so after they tried to initially to get rid of these wild horses, um, they have now kept them and they manage them. Now there's wild horses all over the West that are roaming around, um, but typically most of them are on land owned by the Bureau of Land Management, the BLM. The National Park Service, as I mentioned, they typically get rid of them. I believe this is the only wild horse herd that the National Park Service manages. And they're cool. They're really fun to see these horses out in the wild, right. done yeah. tamed right. Mustangs. And there's people there that are just wild horse watchers and lovers, and they track them, they name them. There's a nonprofit organization there that uh, tracks their every movement, basically. And then they grow, they expand um, in population beyond what the land will allow. So the park actually works with this nonprofit to adopt these horses out to, to people who want them. Pretty, pretty interesting there. This uh, is right next to a little city named Medora, North Dakota, and uh, is part of the experience. So like Theodore Roosevelt National Park could be a good three day, even maybe four day trip of just kind of getting out into the middle of nowhere and enjoying being away from people. And then you want to check out this city, Medora here. So you can see there's this uh, musical going on. The Medora musical is the thing to do in Medora. And um, this, the setting of the musical is in this really gorgeous area. It's, it's just a beautiful amphitheater that you're in. And the musical is real patriotic. Oh, sing songs. Sure. And they do little skits. They talk about Teddy's life. They talk about some of the history of the town. Like that. And the town itself is a, kind of a frontier town. It's a real interesting little place, kind of run all by one foundation. It's like a company town almost. Everybody kind of works for the same employer. You go get an ice cream, a pizza, or whatever, and you're all kind of dealing with the same employees. It's kind of an interesting spot there. But Theodore Roosevelt National Park is our first stop. Now our second stop is Washington, D.C. because we're going to follow Teddy life, Teddy's life to become president of the United States. Now Teddy said that without his time in the Dakotas, he would have never become president. He really felt that was an important time for him to rejuvenate and kind of kind of recover from his tragedy. And then also to kind of learn the ways of the West, well, to get in touch with uh, real people. I think. 
we've got we still mm-hmm. got some noise there let's see i don't know if i can mute everybody somebody's uh chatting on our on our thing there check your your volume and, and mute it if you would please Okay, so let's go to Washington, D.C. here. I want to cover some things to do and see in Washington, D.C. I just did another big trip there last year. I did an internship when I was younger there. I lived in Maryland a little bit. Uh, My wife and I, when she graduated, I took her on a big graduation trip to Washington, D.C. So we we really enjoy visiting D.C. quite a bit. The thing to do there is to visit the National Mall. So in case you're not aware of what the National Mall is, like my friends last year, it's not a shopping center. It's a big, huge park in the middle of the city that's two miles long. So on the one end is the Lincoln Memorial. On the other end is the United States Capitol. On the north is the White House. This stares directly at the Jefferson Memorial. And in the middle of all of them is the Washington Monument. Okay, we've got a question from Silkia. Hi. Hi, Matt. Good good evening. So. Hi. Hi, my question is on the prior, um, the previous park. Is Medora like the place to stay if we were to go to that park? Uh, yes, you can stay in Medora, which is literally right next to the park entry. Or um, you can stay down the road a little bit, about a half hour in Dickinson, North Dakota. That's where we stayed because it was a little cheaper. And when we travel with six people, sometimes it's kind of hard to find a room that will fit us because we've got four kids. So uh, we stayed in Dickinson. That makes sense. All right. Thank you. Uh huh. But Medora would be a really nice place to stay. Just a fun, tiny little charming town that you can walk around and enjoy. So great. Thanks for uh, raising your hand there. I forgot to tell people if you have a question, click the <laughs> little hand button there. Okay. So, um, so you've got kind of a cross going on here on uh, at the mall. And uh, it's m- much bigger than you realize when you're there. It's a lot of walking. So two miles, two miles wide here. Um, quite you know, wide here going this way as well. And uh, I typically walk 10 plus miles when I go to Washington, D.C. and visit the mall. Our subject tonight, Teddy Roosevelt, he has an island named after him at uh, in D.C. But the funny thing is, hardly anybody visits it, It's uh, which, which might make it very nice to visit. You can see it's all wooded here and you'd be getting away from the people, but not one of the main sites you see when you go to Washington, D.C. This, What's the name of the island? Theodore Roosevelt Island. Oh. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I'll look it up. I'm going there next next month, so I'll look it up. I've never been to the island. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Okay. Well, this is awesome. Somebody's going there next month, so uh, all this will apply to you here immediately. So this is the Washington Monument. This is my favorite site in Washington, D.C. This tower is over 500 feet, 550 feet tall. You can actually ride to the top and look out of those windows out there up at the all four directions on the city. That's a must do. You get tickets online in advance to do that. The Lincoln Memorial is what a lot of people think of when they think of Washington, D.C. And here he is kind of situated in a a Greek temple like. So the old saying is Washington made and Lincoln saved our country. Um, So those are the two biggest sites on the mall there, the Washington Monument and then the Lincoln Memorial here. Uh, There's 36 columns surrounding this, one for each state in the Union while he was president. If you go there, there's a sign saying to please be quiet because this is kind of a reverent, hallowed place. Um, You don't make a lot of noise. We were trying to keep our kids quiet last time we went there. Um, On the one end of this, on this end here, is the Gettysburg Address. So when you go inside there, inscribed on the walls, the Gettysburg Address, which we're all probably familiar with that he delivered at or after the Battle of Gettysburg as they were burying the bodies. He delivered the Gettysburg Address, which is, uh, the, the funny thing is that speech was two minutes long. He wasn't even the featured, featured speaker there. There was another guy who spoke for two hours. Lincoln got up and said, nobody's going to remember what I say here, but I'll say it anyway. And then, of course, his words were immortalized. Um, but people don't think too much about the other side, or they, maybe they don't know too much about what's on the other side, which is the second inaugural address. So while Lincoln was president conducting the war, he had to run for re-election against one of his own generals who wanted to end the war and let the South go. He 
he won the election, the election, and then he had, and then he gave a, an inaugural address. So that's called the second inaugural address. And uh, that's every bit as impressive as the Gettysburg Address. I would encourage you to look it up and read through it. Talks all about how uh, we shouldn't judge and uh, treat them as their brothers. His, his, his philosophy there was to bind the nation's wounds and uh, just a marvelous speech from Lincoln there. This is called the Tidal Basin. Um, you can look here on the one end is the Washington Monument. Over on the right is the Jefferson Memorial, another one of my favorites. Jefferson's home is about two or three hours away from Washington, D.C. in Virginia, and is kind of modeled, this, this uh, uh, memorial here is kind of modeled on his home, the design of his home. Jefferson was quite an architect, and he loved the Roman architecture, so he designed his home after the Pantheon in Rome, and this is designed along the same lines. Beautiful, beautiful structure, rated one of the top, I, I read somewhere that some architectural, um, uh, society or whatever rated this like number seven in, in the architectural stuff in America, something like that. Oh, really cool. Okay, the yeah. Capitol is a must see, the Capitol building. So if you visit Washington, D.C., you want to contact your congressional representative before you go, at least three to four weeks before you go, ideally. Typically, you can just uh, get on their website and they'll tell you how to book a tour of the Capitol. And they would love to see you. They love to see people from their, their home state come and visit them, not just from their state, but from their district, their local district. So that's, uh, that's a fantastic thing to do. The Capitol is really beautiful inside and um, highly recommended. I've done it a couple of times. Um, and it's something you got to do when you go visit there. Uh, monuments all over the place. Everywhere you go in Washington, D.C., there's monuments. This is a monument to President James A. Garfield, who nobody knows about anymore, but he was extremely popular in his day, and he was shot within a couple of months of being elected, and he died um, and was uh, has a huge memorial in Ohio. But uh, anyway, monuments everywhere you go in Washington, D.C. You can stop by the White House as well. You can also book a tour of the White House, but my understanding is the tours aren't all that great because the security is so high. They don't really get you to some of the interesting spots. And you have to do that much more in advance than you do the Capitol. So uh, in fact, they're, you can see that they're not even letting you up to the fence anymore. They're blocking the street off to keep you, keep you far away. Arlington National Cemetery is a, a favorite among a lot of people. So this is an interesting place because this home up here is called the Arlington House. This is where Robert E. Lee lived. He was the commanding general of the Southern armies. When the Civil War broke out, Lincoln tried to get him to be the, the general for the North. And he almost did, but he decided mm -hmm. to go with the South, to fight with the South. And so uh, obviously the Northerners were quite upset at him. So they confiscated his property and his home and turned it into a cemetery. And uh, so that he could never have it again and he could never come and claim it. Um, interesting thing is he married uh, a relative of uh, a great granddaughter of Martha Washington. So he, he kind of had a connection to George Washington there with the, the property. Um, down here at the bottom is JFK's grave. He's buried with Jacqueline. Um, and this flame here, you might not be able to see it too well, but this is the eternal flame that's burning. And this, these are two very uh, popular sites to see at. Arlington National Cemetery, as well as the changing of the guard, which I don't, I don't have an image for this, but uh, changing of the guard is another thing that people love to see there. This is Ford's Theater. So most of Washington, D.C. is honoring people who made history. The Ford's Theater is where history actually occurred. So anybody know what happened at Ford's Theater? <laughs> Lincoln shot and killed here. Now, this theater, um, I, I love this. this a couple, I've been there a couple of times. And I, I see this ranger every time. This ranger is the most amazing speaker. So if you end up visiting, I hope you get the same ranger. Uh, up here is where Lincoln was sitting when he was shot by John Wilkes Booth. Booth then jumped onto the stage and shouted something and then ran off. And it took him a while to track him down. And they eventually tracked him down and shot him and killed him. Um, but the ranger explains, they, they call this a box, not a booth they don't want to have John Wilkes Booth name anywhere <laughs> in, the, in the vicinity. Um, the theater is really impressive. It's actually a working theater today. 
after Lincoln was shot, they, out of deference to him, they, out of respect to Lincoln, they shut it down and did no plays and it fell into disrepair, but then somebody bought it and restored it. And it's a beautiful place. And uh, so here, this is another one. You want to book a tour online before you, before you go. And then you got to just sit there in the theater and listen to that guy tell you stories. It's great. This is George Washington's home. This is called Mount Vernon. And this is about 30 minutes away from Washington, D.C. If you go there, um, or if you go to Washington, D.C., you need to try to make it out to Mount Vernon. It's a beautiful estate, just a huge lawn out in front and out in back. You can sit on the rocking chairs where the Potomac River is. Mm -hmm. um, beautiful gardens there. It's just a, a cool place. Washington, George, and Martha are entombed there on the property. And they're guarded by these guys who are decked out in colonial era uh, clothes, soldiers. And so when we were there, we got fortunate. We saw the changing of the guard at, the, um, at their tomb. That was kind of cool. Okay, now, so we're back to Teddy here as the president. While he was president of the United States, he took a huge Western trip through 26 states on a train. And uh, this was a really important trip in the history of the West that doesn't get covered much. Nobody really knows about this, seems like. But it was really quite an important trip because the president was getting out here and seeing news, new sites in the West and learning about some of the challenges that were going on. Uh, this, he's speaking from the back of this train car, and he traveled in a train car called the Elysian. It was like the Air Force one of its day. It was this big, fancy train car. And uh, every town he'd stop in, he'd give a speech from the back of the train. And uh, he gave an average of six speeches per day. I mean, can you, <laughs> can you imagine? Six speeches per day. Um, this dude just loved to talk. Uh, one of my favorite stories about Teddy is somebody went to visit him at the White House once. He spent three hours in his office left his office and the secretary said, well, was the president open to your ideas? And he said, I don't know. I never got a word in edgewise. And at one point he challenged me to a boxing match. So uh, Teddy was just a, just a forceful personality. You can see the intensity in his gaze there. He had a way of connecting with people through these public speeches and influencing uh, policy that way. Um, while he was out on this trip, a little girl gave him a badger she said her brother caught this little baby badger and she wanted him to have it because she knew that he loved wildlife so what did teddy do with that little baby badger he named it josiah after the boy who caught it and he bottle fed that badger every day of his trip <laughs> in that that train car the elysian he had this pet badger and he'd bring it out at all these speeches and show the kids and just love that thing to death so that's kind of a story that indicates who Teddy was. Love it. One of the places he visited on his big Western road trip was Yellowstone. He had actually been there before, and he loved Yellowstone, one of his favorite places. Um, and he loved the wildlife in Yellowstone. This image here is the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone, a really beautiful area that people just um, love. This is kind of the highlight of Yellowstone if you go there. Here's Teddy with his buddy uh, tromping around Yellowstone. They're watching the geyser go off. Here he is camping. He wasn't too interested in the geysers because he just loved the wildlife. But um, he camped out, the, the area that he camped out in, they ended up calling Camp Roosevelt. And a few years after his trip, they built a lodge here and called it Roosevelt Lodge. And uh, this is some, a place that you can visit today. Uh, it's just a little, little lodge that sits up on the northern end of the park. The thing to do there is to rock on the chairs while you wait for your name to be called for lunch or dinner, and, uh, and then go in and eat. And you can actually stay here, see these little cabins on the right. You can um, lodge there if you'd like to. These were built as an alternative to some of the big expensive lodging in the park. So you can see they're kind of small, pretty rustic little lodges there. The other thing you can do when you're there is do the Old West cookout. So we've been going to Yellowstone our whole lives. Uh -huh. and finally, last year, we did this Old West cookout, and it was so enjoyable. They take you out on these 
horses and wagons. They take you to a little valley and they feed you a steak dinner and they've got uh, coffee and Dutch oven cooking. And this guy up, up at the top here, he sings cowboy songs to you. It's really uh, a fun, you know, very fun experience that for us was very new to, to Yellowstone. I mean, we, we don't really think about things like this when we visit Yellowstone because we're pretty close and we're always just kind of running up there. But this was a really great experience. We really enjoyed it. Our whole family loved this. Also on the northern end of the park is this arch here. So they were, they were constructing this arch when Teddy was there on his trip. And they were doing so as a big ceremonial welcome for the visitors. Visitors would get off the train in Montana and they would get on a horse and buggy. And then they would take them around for a week around the park, the tour company would. And this was like the big entrance, which is kind of a cool thing. I like that they built that. Well, because that was being constructed while Roosevelt was there, he gave a speech from the arch and uh, it's been called the Roosevelt arch ever since. So the Teddy Roosevelt or the Roosevelt arch there at Yellowstone. Now, when Teddy was there, he loved seeing the wildlife. He saw a bunch of elk, but he didn't see much bison. And as I mentioned before, the bison were almost extinct, completely extinct. So I mentioned that there were over 20 million bison roaming the plains before the Europeans arrived. By this time, there were probably about 300 bison left in the entire continent. Just 300. And in Yellowstone, today we think of Yellowstone as a bison park. Back then, there were probably 25 bison left at the park. So Teddy hired a guy named Charles Buffalo Jones to come and save the bison in Yellowstone. Now, Charles Buffalo Jones was a bison killer. He was one of these buffalo hunters. But then later, he kind of um, changed his ways and said, oh, these guys are going to be gone. They're going to be off the face of the earth before we know it. And he, he started trying to save them. So um, you need to give him credit for that. And he came to Yellowstone and he established something called the Lamar Buffalo Ranch, which is like a breeding zoo. And today, there are over 4,000 bison in the park. And their big challenge now is that uh, there's, that's kind of the carrying capacity of the park. So, so as the bison um, reproduce, their numbers grow. It's actually a problem for Yellowstone they they would like to just let them wander onto the nearby lands in wyoming and montana and idaho but the states sued them and will not let them do that because they're afraid of the disease that the bison bring to the cattle so every year the yellowstone has to figure out what to do with the excess bison and uh, they sometimes they adopt them out give them out to uh, native american tribes sometimes they kill them it's kind of an issue that it's kind of a big issue that the park has to deal with every year. Okay, so our next stop is the Grand Canyon. So this was, uh, again, a place that Teddy visited on this big Western road trip. He thought that Yellowstone was the most amazing place he'd ever seen in his life until he saw the Grand Canyon. And then he was really uh, amazed. The Grand Canyon, um, if you visit it today, well, what I was going to say is that Teddy, of course, arrived in train, and that was how all the early visitors arrived at the Grand Canyon was by train. I brought that up a couple times, but uh, we often think of kind of commercial interests and national park interests being at odds with each other. But in fact, the national parks were really built by the railroads. Um, they were the ones to get people to these remote places, and they're the ones that did all the advertising for the national parks in the early days. And that was because if they could get tourists riding their trains, then they made money. So they worked very closely together, these two, uh, in the early days to get visitors to these parks. Now, um, the, the train obviously fell out of favor after a while with the automobile, and that changed how people visit the parks, and the, the train went out of business and all that at the Grand Canyon. But in the 1980s, an investor decided to bring it back, and they run this um, this Grand Canyon train that goes from Williams, Arizona to the Grand Canyon um, every day. It's about an hour ride or something like that. And on the way, they'll sing cowboy songs and they do kind of Old West stuff. 
And I haven't done it yet, but everybody I've talked to just loves that experience. And so one of these days, we'll have to get down there and do the Grand Canyon train. The other thing that Teddy did while he was there is went on a mule ride. So this is one of the famous things to do at the Grand Canyon is to ride a mule down to the bottom of the canyon. Now, if you've never been to the Grand Canyon before, it is about a mile deep. Um, the canyon is about a mile deep, which is kind of mind blowing. But to get to the bottom of it, because you're going through switchbacks and whatnot, is about seven miles. That's not so bad, except it gets hotter and hotter the further you go down. And then the problem, of course, is you got to come back up, right? And so that's where a lot of people get in trouble at the Grand Canyon is they, they go down too far, and then they don't realize what a nightmare is going to be to get out. Um, so there's a lot of deaths actually in the Grand Canyon. There's been over 900 deaths at the Grand Canyon, one of our most deadly national parks. Well, mule rides have been a long tradition down to the Grand Canyon. It's how the, you know, the early miners got in and out of the canyon. It's how a lot of people traveled down to the bottom of the canyon and back today. Mule rides are really competitive. I put in, you have to put in a year in advance to get a mule ride down to the bottom of the canyon because what you do is you go down there and then you stay at a ranch called Phantom Ranch, little cabins called Phantom Ranch. You can actually hike down there or take a mule ride down there and stay at the ranch. But to do so, you have to put into a lottery a year in advance and get selected. That's how competitive it is. And I put in every month and I have not been selected yet. So it's pretty, pretty tough to get a uh, a place at Phantom Ranch down at the bottom of the canyon. But these mules are, are really cool. They're, uh, they're fun. We actually, you can do mule rides along the rim of the canyon. So not going all the way down in, but just up on the edge. So at the Grand Canyon, my wife and my daughter did a, a mule ride last year and they just loved it. My daughter's mule's name was Chi Chi. And so she'll never forget that. Great experience. Um, the problem at this time when Teddy visited is that People were trying to mine in the Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon was not protected in any way at this point. It wasn't a national park or a national monument or anything like that. And Arizona was, has been fiercely uh, independent when it comes to the federal government claiming land as national park type stuff. They didn't want uh, them meddling into their affairs or anything like that. So they were really trying to keep the Grand Canyon free so that they could mine in there and do whatever else they wanted. Um, the, the, one of the major problems in the Southwest at this time was people were going into these places with Indian ruins and they were taking the ruins of like the pottery and they were just stealing all this stuff. And there was no way to prosecute them because these were just open lands that people could do whatever they want for the most part. So Teddy um, gave a speech at the Grand Canyon and he said, we need to protect this place. Um, in fact, he said, do not build any buildings here because you cannot improve upon the Grand Canyon. This is, you know, God's masterpiece type of a thing. And uh, so I urge you not to build anything here. So what they did is they built a bunch of buildings here. <laughs> and, um, these are actually, I think, a very cool part of the experience of visiting the Grand Canyon. They have uh, kind of a Native American inspired buildings. This is the Hopi House. Desert View Watchtowers over here. This one down here is called Hermit's Rest. And it's made to look like a hermit lived there. It's actually inspired by a hermit who did live there, although the building wasn't his. This is a, a modern construction. And then the house in the middle, or the place in the middle is called El Tavar. And this kind of illustrates something too. El Tavar was built to kind of look like a, a Swiss or a Norwegian chalet type of a building. But then it's kind of mixed in with this Western element. And that was the idea. So what they were really trying to do at the time, this is early 1900s. The wealthier Americans in the East were traveling to Europe for their vacations. And as the national parks were getting going, they were trying to uh, do this campaign to say, you need to see America first. Spend your money in the country and come and see your natural wonders out West. Uh, but they wanted to court those wealthy Easterners with some fancier lodges and stuff. So they, they built this kind of a, on a, 
the type of a thing what they might see in Europe to, to get them to come out west, but then they also wanted to introduce them to some of the western uh, flair that we have out here, I guess. So that's an interesting little mix there. Um, so, oh, let me go back one, one more thing. Teddy vowed um, to save the Grand Canyon after this visit. He was so amazed by it. He said, we have to save this and keep the mining interests out and keep people from stealing these Indian uh, ruins and stuff like that. So within a few years, um, Congress passed a law called the Antiquities Act. The Antiquities Act allows the president to set aside certain lands as national monuments, which instantly protects them kind of on the level of a national park. The kind of national parks junior is what they are. National parks have to go through a long congressional uh, approval process. And uh, it was just too impractical to do that with all these places in the West. And so they said, okay, we're gonna give the president authority to just protect these with a stroke of a pen basically. And that's what Teddy did, protected the Grand Canyon as a national monument. And then it was turned into a national park about 10 years later. And the Antiquities Act, well, I'll, I'll get to the Antiquities Act here in a minute. Our next stop is the Black Hills. So we're kind of done with Teddy's road trip and all that. And now I'm going to move on to the Black Hills because this is, well, you might have already discovered the connection with Teddy and the Black Hills, but we'll get to that in a minute. Um, this is a section called the Needles. Um, we love the Black Hills. The Black Hills are located in South Dakota and, uh, and actually cross over into Wyoming a little bit. And this is Devil's Tower, which is located in Wyoming. Devil's Tower was the first national monument. So once Teddy got the authority to protect these lands, Devil's Tower was the first one that he said, okay, we're going to protect this as a national monument. The, the, the Antiquities Act has always been kind of a controversial thing. So I live in Utah, and we have um, President Clinton protected a big section of land called Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. Uh, later, Barack Obama protected land called Bears Ears National Monument. Uh, a lot of these presidents will do so at the end of their term, and then, and then they leave office. They don't want to deal with the, <laughs> the, the fallout from it because the locals get really upset because once you protect the land, it means there's a ton of things you can't do with it that you used to be able to do with it. So it's, it's kind of a controversial thing to do, but they still have pretty, pretty much unlimited power on being able to do that. Devil's Tower is a delightful place to visit. This tower, you saw the Washington Monument earlier in, in my presentation. This tower is 800 feet tall, and the Washington Monument was uh, about 550 feet tall. So it's kind of hard to get from this image here, but it's much taller than even the Washington Monument. Really just a cool, interesting little place. All you do is take a little walk around it. There's some prairie dogs there, um, visitor center few things that you can do. You can actually go to the campground nearby. Each night they show uh, the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind, which the tower was featured. <laughs> Every night they show that movie. We stayed in a teepee next or uh, near the tower this last year, and it was really fun. So, Okay, our next stop in the Black Hills is uh, Wind Cave National Park. This is a, a national park that not a lot of people know about. It's the seventh national park, though. And it's the seventh largest cave in the world from my understanding. So what you do here at Wind Cave is you have to book a tour. So the, the cave's so big, the rangers will take you on a tour in the cave. And they've got um, cement pathways and stairs. Like they've gone in and prepared the whole thing for you. Uh, I'm a little claustrophobic, maybe like maybe more than a little claustrophobic. Um, but I was able to do this. It was fine. The cave is just huge and big, and it was really quite an enjoyable experience to do in the Black Hills. Here's, here's the ranger giving us a presentation in Wind Cave National Park. Up on top of the cave is Prairie mm -hmm. Lands, and uh, they've got a bison herd there. Now, my understanding is this bison herd came from the Yellowstone herd. They actually transported them. Now, the, I mentioned that the Yellowstone herd had only 25 bison left. They believe that that is the only purebred herd left in the country. Because when I mentioned when Charles Buffalo Jones was trying to restore the bison, one of the things he was doing was 
mixing them with cattle. And uh, so the, from my understanding, most, uh, almost all bison have cattle DNA in them. But the Yellowstone one doesn't. They say that was, uh, they never in intermingled. And then they've taken a couple of offshoot bison herds from Yellowstone and uh, Wind Cave is one of them. So I believe that this is kind of a purebred herd here at Wind Cave. This was kind of fun. Um, something else to do in the Black Hills is Custer State Park. Uh, this is actually the heart of the Black Hills. So it's not a national park, it's a state park, but it is the best. It's just a great thing to visit. And there are three scenic drives in Custer State Park. This is called the Wildlife Loop. And on the Wildlife Loop, you'll see bison and prairie dogs and these wild donkeys here, these burrows. And these are just wild burrows, just like those wild horses earlier in this presentation. They're just roaming bison, or I mean, roaming burrows, roaming around. And now there's wild burrows all over the West as well, just like there are wild horses. Um, we've seen some in Oatman, Arizona, and some other places, and they're they're actually really fun. They're usually very um, they just come and mooch food off you, and they're really they're really pretty cute and they're fun. The, the wild horses, on the other hand, are, can be dangerous. You don't want to get close to them, but the donkeys, pretty chill. This is another drive in Custer State Park called the Needles Highway. And you can see why it's called the Needles, all these things just jutting out of the ground. This is one of the coolest drives you will ever go on. It is just gorgeous, amazing country in the Black Hills there, the Needles Highway, really cool. And then this road here, this image is called the Iron Mountain Highway. And this actually will take you right to Mount Rushmore. And it takes you on this, and again, this amazing scenic drive. And what's cool about the, the roads here is they've built these tunnels that you drive through and they're engineered to show off the best of their scenery. And so this tunnel is pointing you right at Mount Rushmore. This is kind of your first thing that you see if you take this highway to get to Mount Rushmore. It's really quite a cool experience the way they've engineered it. I have to admit, I'm a little bit of a nerd. I've actually done some, <laughs> some studying on like road construction in the national parks and what their theory is. This isn't a national park itself, but, but uh, this kind of intrigues me a lot how these engineers and road designers build their roads. This is Sylvan Lake. This is on the Needles Highway. And uh, again, part of Custer State Park. This lake was featured in the movie National Treasure 2. Um, and it's just a cool area. This is like, you've got to do this if you go to Mount Rushmore. you got to get over to Sylvan Lake. And what they have there is you could just walk around the lake, a little walk. You can kind of scramble up on some of these rocks, which I do with my kids all the time. You can rent kayaks here and just kayak around the lake. They have a little swimming area. Just a great place, Sylvan Lake. Okay, and then of course, Mount Rushmore. Mount Rushmore is, is a part of the Black Hills. So the original um, visionaries for Mount Rushmore, the reason why they came up with the idea was they wanted tourists to come to their park. I mean, to come to their area. They wanted people to discover the Black Hills. So how to get them there was, uh, was the question. And so they, they constructed Mount Rushmore as, as really kind of a tourist attraction to get people there. So I always say you, you, go to, you go to see Mount Rushmore, but you stay for the Black Hills. And uh, of course, they've got the presidents on here. Now, when I first went when I was younger, um, I didn't know much. I, I, was, I was young, wasn't interested in history and all that. Didn't know much about these guys. I, I kind of wondered why Teddy was on there. Um, he seemed a little out of place with some of these other big names that were that were so common or so popular um, and you know so much spoken of. And if you built Mount Rushmore today, he would be replaced by Franklin D. Roosevelt. Um, Jefferson might have a hard time making it on there, although I think he should be on there. I think they should all be on there. Um, but Teddy would be replaced by Franklin D. Roosevelt, his fifth cousin. They were cousins. Um, Jefferson. But I think he really deserves to be on there. I mean, he just did so much during his presidency that if any president today did just one of the things that he accomplished, 
that would be considered a successful presidency, I think. And he did so much. It's almost hard to define Teddy Roosevelt because he did so much. He won the Nobel Peace Prize while he was president for brokering peace between Russia and Japan. He finished the Panama Canal. He, he worked on breaking up monopolies, uh, big companies, um, led the progressive movement. It just was a fascinating individual who got stuff done. One of my, one of my favorite um, things to think about is Thomas Jefferson is known as the writing president. He wrote over 20,000 letters while he was president. Teddy Roosevelt wrote 150,000 letters while he was president. I mean, by the time he was president at age 42, he uh, had already published multiple books and articles and had just accomplished so much in his life and then went on to do even more after he was president. Really just an amazing person. When it comes to our story here tonight, um, Teddy was an incredibly important person in the history of the West. So what I say is the West changed Teddy when he was younger. He went out to the Dakota Badlands and just connected with nature and with himself. And again, always credited the Badlands for becoming president. When he was president, he went on that big road trip in 1903. And from that ended up protecting over five uh, or five national parks, 18 national monuments, 18 national monuments, that's insane, 51 federal bird reserves, four national game preserves, 150 national forests, including some in my backyard here, 230 million acres of public land he protected. So when he was younger, the West changed Teddy, and when he was president, Teddy changed the West. So there we go. That's my presentation for you.